Let's start with uh, Chris. Well, um, I'm with the uh, Fallon uh, Plant Material Center over here, the Great Basin Plant Material Center. And uh, well, I'm just interested in riparian areas in general. They, uh, I'm a rangeland specialist, so I always uh, often interact with them, and uh, they tend to define uh, how pastures are used, so it's always good to really um, assess them properly. And I'm here to reinforce that knowledge. All right. Thanks, Chris. And uh, I see Jim Shepard's with us. Jim, you want to um, weigh in and let us know who you are and um, also a little, about, a little bit about your connection to repairing and what you hope to get out of the day? Jim is probably on mute or something. And we've also got John Paul Kyle. John Paul, how about uh, weighing in? And how about Patrick? Are you with us still? And how about Robert? Yes, can you hear me okay? Yes. Sure, I work as the land resources specialist for the soil and water conservation district in our area. Um, our main interest is we support monitoring on public land grazing allotments, typically forest service allotments. And so we're interested just in expanding our kind of toolkit of um, ways to collect information that then land managers are going to use to inform their um, permit renewals, um, changes to permits. So we've worked both um, you know, with other conservation districts, with um, contractors in this work, with forest range conservationists, um, and just want to expand our expertise in providing these services. Okay, thanks. And uh, Scott. I'm Scott Lusk. I'm the forest range staff on the Plumas National Forest in Region 5. I've worked with PFC since they were starting there in Prineville, Oregon, and I could just take Kurt and see what all's going on with it. Okay, well, um, there is a, a little bit of um, update this year, and of course, um, that's part of the motivation for these webinars is that there is a brand new Lodic handbook out. And um, so um, later on, we'll talk a bit more about what that means. Uh, we usually start our program off with uh, a bit of introductions because really people are fundamentally important in riparian management. And then we go into a section that we call Creeks and Communities. Um, the website on the screen is the website where I uh, post the slides. Unfortunately, I've revised these slides as late as this morning. And so um, the website uh, doesn't yet have the current version. It's my goal within the next week or so to get the current version that are up on this webinar um, posted on that um, uh, website that's on your screen. If you ever want to uh, um, download these slides for your own purposes or to um, refresh yourself or to check something, you're certainly welcome to do that. So um, with that, let's, uh, let's go ahead and get started. And uh, let's see if this works the normal way. It doesn't. I can't hit the space bar. So how about if I hit the down key? It doesn't work either, so I'll hit the arrow key. Does that work? Next slide. Yes. Okay. So cooperative riparian stewardship is the idea that got started back in the 90s when people realized that we couldn't fix riparian problems by postage stamping the West with exclosures. Many people recognized we had a problem with cattle grazing management primarily, although there are lots of other things that cause issues with riparian areas. That seemed to be the big one that we were finally ready to um, commit ourselves to in the 80s and struggling with how to do it. And as we began to do that, a lot of people realized that if you put a fence around an area that has um, poor grazing management, uh, the riparian area has a tremendous ability to heal itself. 
But that small exposure, because we can't exclude riparian areas throughout watersheds, it's, it's uh, physically, economically, and socially not practical. Uh, that small exposure doesn't fix the, the overall problem. So um, some colleagues up in Primeville and across the West realized that to fix the problem, we really had to have cooperative riparian stewardship uh, and restoration among the many people. And so that effort led to uh, the riparian proper functioning condition assessment protocol that we're going to talk about today, but it also led to the uh, creeks and communities process that is going on Hi. around the West. Hope he's here. Uh, could somebody uh, put on their mute button, please? Thank you. So, you know, floods happen, and uh, flooding certainly gets our attention. It's inconvenient. Uh, we could talk about the serial engineering that happens after floods. Uh, we could we could think about. What might be in the mind of this lad as he contemplates the opportunity to uh, control the power that is at his disposal? And as you can see in the surrounding slides, we have either used our power or failed to use our power in many places, and that has had yeah. consequences for riparian areas. Somebody is uh, not muted and, and talking. If they could uh, fix that problem, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Um, so we hope that lad does um, not put his other foot on that skateboard. skateboard. Um, what we hope instead is that people around the West embrace this idea of accelerating cooperative riparian stewardship and to work on an interagency basis so that we're working on all of the lands in many watersheds or at least the big portions of many of the watersheds in the West. Uh, the Bureau of Land Management land, Forest Service land, as well as the private land. It's um, increasingly apparent to me that our best waters in the West are on private land. And it's also those lands on private lands where we usually have the low gradient systems that are most in need of riparian functions. And what we've realized through time is that restoration will not happen by regulation, changes in the law, or more money, or any of the normal bureaucratic processes. It will only occur through the integration of ecological, economic, and social factors, and the participation of those who are most affected. So we need to engage people to increase awareness and share understanding of riparian function and the sustainability that that brings across a large number of diverse people. I remember being part of a riparian conference in Albuquerque in 1994, and at that uh, conference it was the repeated story over and over and over. People had frustrations trying to accomplish things for their watershed or their river or their riparian area until they brought all of the affected interests to the bank of the stream and talked about what that stream meant to them and how they could work together to fix it. That sort of thought process has led to the Riparian Coordination Network, and today we find that the National Riparian Service Team out of uh, Pineville, Oregon, is augmented with state riparian teams. I happen to be the coordinator for the Nevada team. There are coordinators in other states, many of the western states, and local teams. You're going to hear today from uh, John McCann. I forgot to introduce him. John, step up and introduce yourself. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is John McCann. I'm the forest developer for the Humboldt Toyabe National Forest. I've been helping Sherm out in teaching POC classes for about uh, four or five years now, and uh, glad to be here with you. So John is the agency coordinator for riparian management for the Forest Service here in Nevada. We also have um, Sarah Peterson. I think Sarah may be online. Sarah, do you want to introduce yourself? She may have stepped away from the from the phone, probably just checking up on me to make sure that I showed up for work this morning. But uh, anyway, Sarah Peterson is the hydrologist for the uh, state of uh, state office in Nevada. She's on detail now down in Caliente at the current time. Um, but uh, she and John are uh, agency coordinators. We also have uh, Patty Novak in the NRCS office in Nevada and lots of other team members that form our Nevada State Creeks and Communities team. 
there are people across the West that are generally interested in riparian areas and their management, proper management, and happy to support the process. They become partners, and sometimes we form technical teams or top, topical teams about specific uh, issues and things that we need more technical focus about and so forth. Throughout the process, since the early 90s, riparian proper functioning condition has been a real foundation for how this process works. And the reason why riparian proper functioning condition is at the heart of this process is because by focusing on the physical functions of riparian areas, we find that we um, bring the functions into play that all of the stakeholders need in order to support their own personal interests or their agency's interests. And so we don't talk about the difference in values that we might become divided about. Some people might think one of the values represented in this uh, collage of photographs is more important than some other value. But to the people around the circle, that wouldn't be a subject of unity. What is a subject of unity, of like-mindedness, of an ability to collaborate is to pursue the idea that we need riparian systems to function, physically function in a way that works for everybody. To accomplish that, the national team and the state teams have been doing community-based trainings and sometimes service trips in order to help people do that. The idea of that is that we bring people together in a continuing strategy for accelerating cooperative riparian stewardship, um, bring people to the field so they can see things firsthand, and when we're in the field, we talk about those physical functions in a way that allows everybody to understand what's going on. You know, riparian area management can be um, a kind of a tense situation. It is a, a different way of doing things. Change is always hard for people. And riparian areas are complex, as we'll see today. Um, and they can be fraught with conflict. Sometimes views can become polarized. And so in that sort of an environment, how can people work together to find common solutions? Well, um, the first thing, the world is run by those who show up. And so uh, sometimes you have to recruit people to show up. But when people show up and you dive in and work hard on the problems, it's amazing what can be accomplished if you have the expertise in the room as well as the, the landowners in the room, as well as the interests that care passionately about one view or another. Um, and with that, you can do cooperation, a social skill involving working together for independent as well as collective interests through reflective listening and genuine articulation of ideas in a partnership of mutual respect and diversity. The diversity of ideas is critically important. And um, often, in order to accomplish that, you need facilitation. Somebody there that is simply managing the communication process among the people. I remember early in my career working in coordinated resource management, I saw lots of meetings that weren't accomplishing as much as they could have if they'd only had better meeting management and better facilitation. So that's an important skill. Sometimes it's a necessary skill in order to bring people to the idea of consensus, a method of making decisions through which a group strives to reach substantial agreement on matters of overall direction and policy, and that is supported by all. Maybe not exactly what everybody wanted when they entered the room, but not a compromise, usually it's a synergistic new solution that people can get excited about. And people from a diversity of interests, because you're focused on expanding the pie with functions that actually work to provide the values that we all care about. We don't get there with lawsuits and regulatory approaches because they often leave out the people who must implement the solutions and the people who are most affected by the management. And, you know, it's really easy to stop things with a lawsuit. The harder challenge is to start things and keep them going. To do that, we need communities of people that are focused on the creek. And creeks do connect people. They're also a place where lots of different sciences interconnect. 
And so we need to connect that diversity of science to the diversity of people so that they can be focused on the things that the whole community of them want. They must work together individually for restoration and improvement on a large scale. Together and individually, we can really make it happen. We can get into this continuing spiral and spiral up where through awareness and understanding, we can come to agreement and put actions on the ground. Then we can test whether those actions are working the way we want them to, and if not, then we can adapt our management, or because they did work, we can adapt our management because systems change, and as systems change, we need to be aware of what they need next or what we now have the flexibility to do that we couldn't have accomplished to begin with. To do that, we need good science, but it's, although it's important, it's seldom enough. And the reason it's not enough to resolve these conflicts is because we have conflicting science. Um, and good science changes. It's, it's this, um, you know, the idea of science is that it will continue to change as we learn more. We'll stand on the shoulders of those who came before so that we can see farther. And sometimes we learn from people in entirely other parts of the country. Uh, early on, I remember having a graduate student focused on finding places in Nevada where we had been doing good grazing management. People in Nevada seemed to think that it was something that could work in Oregon but wouldn't work here. And yet what, when we started looking, we found lots of examples here in Nevada too. And that process of bringing knowledge from somewhere else but using it in a way that it makes sense locally is part of this continuing evolving uh, practice of uh, managing for proper functioning conditions. And when we do that, we bring in the right social and political factors which are necessary in order to keep this thing working. So useful scientific information, what is that? Well, it has to be understandable to the stakeholders with a range of scientific backgrounds, a range of educational levels, and a, way, a range of ways of knowing about things. Some people learn from experience out on the ground, and they have deep knowledge about that, but it isn't very deep in book learning, and other people have a lot of time in college classrooms and with those textbooks. It has to be seen by all parties as legitimate and valid, believable relevant to the local situation and trusted because it was created by people that we know care about the things that we care about. You know, uh, the old saying about we don't care how much you know until we know how much you care, and that develops by people working together to create their own knowledge. And then using that knowledge to identify the costs and the benefits, the risks and the trade-offs of various alternatives. In the end, it isn't the science that should make the decision. It should inform the decision, but the decision has to be made by a human process. Our society is literally awash today in data, information, knowledge, science, and yet in many places our creeks are failing to provide the values they could when healthy. What is lacking is fully understanding what it all means and then having the wisdom to apply what we know in ways that best meet the needs of people and the ecosystem. Although there is an important role for science and technical information, natural resource issues are not simply scientific or technical decisions. They're public policy decisions. That's from Laura Van Riper. She's the social scientist on the National Agrarian Service Team. When the proper functioning condition approach, uh, assessment approach was being used around the West, she did her PhD dissertation actually studying that. And what she learned is that one of the most exciting things that was happening is not just that people were learning better science, but they, that the, the science applied through PFC assessment was causing people to come together with about how to manage creeks, getting excited about the things they could do with that science. In the end, it was the people who were resolving those social conflicts, and yet the science was very much a part of that. By focusing on stream health, we created visions across the West of what is possible and what is needed for management and for restoration. And it was through her learning and putting principles of social science together with the principles of interdisciplinary biophysical sciences that we realized that 
if you bring the right people together and you facilitate that in constructive ways, and you have good information, those people will work together and they will produce better decisions. And in the process of doing that, because they all have a role and we're being hard on the problem but easy on the people, we will improve relationships. And because we're fixing the problem and making things better and improving relationships, we end up with sustainable communities and sustainable landscapes. That is really exciting. So it's fundamentally important to bring affected interests together, then to create learning environments, build relationships and trust, build community information base, and by doing so, empower the people to spiral up through our um, knowledge as it gets better, through our management as it gets better, and through our communities as they have stronger social fabrics within them. So who do you bring together? Well, you have to have the people who have an interest or a concern, and a lot of those people are going to show up anyway. They're self-identified. They just, they're engaged. They realize that this is a big issue for them. It's an important part of their economic future, or it's about a part of the land that they have passion for. And you also need those people who are going to be needed to implement the outcome. And sometimes those are the line officers in the agencies. Sometimes they're the people who are going to fund things. Uh, sometimes it's the on-the-ground workers who need to understand what they're trying to accomplish, what they're meant to accomplish, so that they can do the right things at the right time. But you also need those people who are likely to be skeptics or critics who might undermine the effort because they too can learn through this process to have appreciation for what it is that we're all collectively trying to accomplish. So once they're together, then you have to create learning environments, safe environments where people can ask questions so that they can be real with each other but respectful of each other. And in the process, you explain basic ecological processes about complex systems, but you do so in a way that everybody can understand it. Now, that's a challenge, but it's been accomplished in, across the West in many, many different meeting rooms and um, out in the field on various creek sides. And then you listen to everybody for new possibilities. Often in these processes, people stand or sit in a circle so that you can go around the circle and everybody in that circle gets to have their voice, but also when someone speaks, everybody in the circle has an opportunity to hear and to understand just exactly what that person is saying and what the deep meanings are because they can read their body language as well. By doing that, working together for creeks and communities, we build a community information base. We develop a common vocabulary, an understanding of physical function. We come to recognize how things take time. There are things that come first, and then later on, other parts of the biophysical process can begin to happen. There is a risk. Sometimes you get the flood, and floods can have a lot of power. They can do a lot of damage. Sometimes you focus on what the alternatives cost, because there are cheap to apply alternatives, and they're expensive to apply alternatives. And when you combine all of that, with the risk and the time and so forth, then the group can make better decisions. Of course, everybody in the group is going to be making individual choices, but collectively they're making watershed choices. And sometimes those watershed choices are about what individuals do, and sometimes it's about what they can do together. One of the exciting things that um, occurs in many places is that people develop a bit of a coalition. And politicians love to fund coalitions. Other funding entities, foundations and whatever, love to fund something that people have come to agreement about, especially if that group of people represents a diversity. How do you do that? Well, you get people out on the field. You get joint fact-finding, collecting the data, doing the PFC monitoring. And you structure the conversation so that it is about those things that really drive the physical functions because that also drives the values. You also empower people to create change by improved relationships, by having more trust, by having the technical know-how and support. And when you do that, you develop the financial support. And when you have the financial support to put the right things on the ground, 
it's amazing what you can accomplish. This is a group of people. I'm going to go get a chance to visit with this group of people in uh, in a, a week or two. Uh, this is the Shoe Soul Group, and um, that's on the bank of Goat Creek up on the Cottonwood Ranch, and that group of people gets their picture taken on a regular basis because they're excited about what they have accomplished together. And the reason they were able to accomplish that together is because they really focused on the shared vision that all of them could provide input to so that it was a, a shared vision for all of them.